everybody. Hope everyone's had a great, great time, great week. Um, this is Troy Lamel Stovall, the CEO and Executive Director for Maryland Tedco. And I am here today, I think many of you know, my, uh, one of my uh, life's journeys was uh, being a C-level executive uh, at, H at several HBCUs. And so I am, couldn't be more excited to have another warrior with me, not just in higher ed, but with the HBCU world, uh, president of, of the great Morgan State University, President David Wilson. David, thank you, thank you, thank you for, for being here with me today. Hey, uh, Troy, it's a pleasure being here uh, with you and look forward to the conversation. Cool, cool. Well, look, let's, uh, well, let's actually have a little fun. We were talking a little right off before camera. Um, so <laughs> we're taping this and we were talking about a, a video that's going around with one of our, uh, one of our other HPCU presidents who is doing his, showing his basketball handles. And so you say you got a little basketball moves too. So why don't you tell us your, your basketball moves story? Well, you know, I've actually been playing basketball Monday, Wednesday, Friday, almost throughout my career uh, during the lunch hour with faculty, staff, and students. I haven't done as much of it here at Morgan, uh, but um, I ha do occasionally, you know, have to go over <laughs> to the gym uh, and show uh, uh, incredible students here that, hey, uh, your president can still shoot that three-pointer. <laughs> so, you know, they like, wow, Dr. Prez, I can't believe it. You actually made three in a row. Uh, but I, I, I too saw that uh, video from uh, my brother, president at Virginia State, and uh, it was well done. That was good. Yeah, that was that was a great video. That was fun. So, why don't you tell folks a little bit about uh, not just your your journey? Because one of the things, uh, President Wilson, we like to say when we're doing these techo talks is we we want people to hear your journey, but not so much the journey itself. But someone's listening is going to hear something about your journey that's gonna inspire them and say, wow, he, he was able to persevere over that. So tell a little folks about your journey and obviously let us know it's about the, the great institution of Morgan State. Hmm. Well, uh, that's a mouthful there as well. I know it is, I know it is. <laughs> but I, I'll, I'll try to truncate this. Uh, you know, I often say to people uh, that um, if you had predicted my life um, when I was born, it would never under any circumstances um, have led me in the direction that that I took. Uh, so I, I, I grew up in what they call abject poverty, mm. uh, rural Alabama on a little red dirt road between two creeks, so to speak. <laughs> um, and uh, my father um, was a sharecropper. And so we farmed uh, cotton growing up uh, and I had to pick cotton. And so yeah. there was no laws in Alabama that said black children like David must go to school. And so my father did not send us to school with any mm. regularity, Troy. And so um, he would have the system in place where he would keep us out of school and we would you know, three days a week and we would go to and then he would reverse it the following week. And so I was in the seventh grade, believe it or not, before I went to school five consecutive days. Wow. I'm the youngest of 10 children, um, first in my family, obviously, to go to college. Um, and so I never heard of college before um, until on one of those days that my father allowed me to go to school. I was in the sixth grade. Uh, and my uh, sixth grade teacher was uh, the late uh, sister of the late Reverend Ralph David Abernathy and Mrs. Louvenia Abernathy Coates. And so she said, you know, David, mm, can you stop by my desk uh, at the end of school today? I want you to go home and tell your father something. And so I said, sure. And so I stopped by her desk and she said, look, I want you to go home and tell your daddy that if he could figure out a way to send you to school, five consecutive days, I think you could go to college. That's why I never heard college before. And I raced home and said to my father, you know, Mrs. Coates told me to tell you this. If you can send me to school, man, five days a week, I can go to college. And my father said, uh, he said, boy, let me tell you something. He said, college is for white people. Mm. And we didn't talk about it again. But then five years passed and I started going to school five days a week in the seventh grade. I got really excited about the magic of education. I had grown up in this little shanty with no electricity, no plumbing, mm. none of the so-called modern conveniences. Mm. And it would be so cold in there in the winter time that my mom would have to figure out a way to keep us warm. And so she would take a uh, look in life magazines that the whites who owned the plantation really would have left at the house. Exactly. And we as children would plaster these things against the wall to keep the cold wind out. And that was really how I learned to read. And that was really how 
I began to understand that there was a really big world out there. Uh, and so by staying in that little shanty, I was able to go halfway around the world without leaving the confines of that little shanty. Mm -hmm. And so when I got up that morning, five years later, to go off to college, um, only applied to one school because in my view, it was the best college in America <laughs> and it was Tuskegee. And by a miracle, they accepted me. And so uh, I'm about to go out this door uh, to get a ride to Tuskegee with the parents of one of my high school classmates who was also going to Tuskegee because we didn't have a car. And I would never forget this tour. So at about five o'clock in the morning, as I was standing there in what we call the front room, um, about to go out the front door, I heard someone get up in the adjacent room and it was my father. Mm. And he made his way into the front room. He had on these overalls and he looked at me. Now this is five o'clock in the morning. And he said, David, this time he called me by my name. He says, son, he said, I'm so proud of you. Wow. wow. He said, you're about to do something that no one in this family has ever, ever done. He said, you're about to go to college. He said, you better go to Tuskegee. And he said, you know, five years ago, you told me you wanted to do this. Do you recall what I said to you? And I said, sure, daddy, I recall because it was so painful. And he said, let me tell you what I was really thinking. He said, what I was really thinking was how in the hell will I ever pay for you to go to college? Mm -hmm. But he said, I've been saving for this day. He said, I've been saving for the day when I would see my little David go out that front door to college. And so he reached in his overalls. Oh, this man. Out <laughs> something that he called a piece of money. And he asked me to hold out my hand and I did. And he put this piece of money in my hand and he put it in my hand so hard I thought he was going to go through my hand to the floor. And then he took his hand and he put it over mine. And he said, now this is all that I have. And I'm investing it in you. Man, this is bummer. And I looked in his face and it's the first time, Troy, that I had ever seen my father cry. Cry, you're making me cry, dude. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I said to him, daddy, I will, I will. You're making me cry. And I went on the front porch and as the sun was coming up, I opened my hand and there in my hand was a crisp $5 bill. So to bring this to a close, yeah, I have two degrees from Harvard, two degrees from Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. I met world leaders all over the world. Yeah. But every single day, I have here in my office, on this little shelf behind me here, mm -hmm. my life to remind me of where I got this start and what my obligation is as a leader. And so it's a $5 bill. Bill, there. I'm about to say, it's gotta be the $5 bill. It's gotta be, a, it's gotta be the $5 bill. A $5 bill there. Gotta be. Uh, and I uh, started uh, 10 years ago, uh, a scholarship fund here at Morgan. Mm -hmm. $5 scholarship fund uh, in honor of the investment my father has made in me. And that fund right now is valued at, I think, close to $1.5 million. Outstanding. Bravo. Bravo. Man, there's so many. I'm serious. You, you got me crying. But, you know, it's I could give you a chance to talk about Morgan. But I, I don't know how many years ago that was. That story, I'm sure it's decades ago. But that story is still being repeated today in 2021. There's That's so it. many out there. And. You know, I've seen them at Jackson State and at, at Howard at UDC where I've been. And those first generation kids are still out there. Those first generation, first time in college for that family are still, that $5 story is still happening here in 2021. And you get some of those kids at Morgan. Oh, we get a lot of those kids here at Morgan. Uh, about 25% of our student population here at Morgan are what we call first generation college going students. Morgan is hands down uh, one of the most consequential institutions of higher learning in this nation. We know how to take every single student here at Morgan, whatever credentials you present to us, and we meet you where you are. Mm. We take you where you need to be so that when you walk across the stage here at Morgan and you get your sheepskin from what we call the national treasure, <laughs> you are equipped 
to compete on the world stage with anyone, any place, anytime, anywhere. Whether you showed up here with a 1600 SAT or 1000. There you go. Oregon is number one in the US in producing black electrical engineers. We're number one in civil, we're number one in industrial, we're number five in the US in producing black engineers in all fields. We are one of the leading institutions in this nation in producing black scientists. As a matter of fact, the National Science Foundation did a study several years ago. They looked at every single black person in the United States who had a PhD in either engineering or a science-based discipline. And they wanted to know, where did you get from? undergrad? Mm -hmm. And amongst black males, Morgan was number two in the nation. And amongst black females, we're number one. And so this amazing. institution of about 8,000 students from oh, 35 states, uh, 60 countries. Uh, we are a research high university and we are aspiring to be a flagship research one institution and join the company of only 130 of the 3,500 institutions in the country in that category. Well, let's, let's take right there. I mean, there's a lot of places I could go because I could, I mean, well, I'm going to go there, but a lot of places, I want to go back to just your story real quick, because what I heard, I heard a lot, but what I really heard was about perseverance. Um, I heard a story of a perseverance. There's a lot of other pieces and a lot of other adjectives, and I wanted our listeners to hear your perseverance story, because again, like you said, someone's listening. Someone's there in, in rural Alabama, or hell, rural Virginia, or rural Maryland. They're hearing your story, and they need to know that that somebody does care, and there's a school like Morgan State that's really ready and willing to accept them, as you said, as they are. And so I congratulate you. And, and what I didn't say at the beginning of this, folks understand, uh, President Wilson has been President Wilson, uh, Morgan State for 10 years. And that's that in and of itself, <laughs> forget all his other accomplishments. So for someone who knows, that in and of itself is an accomplishment, okay? <laughs> to be at an institution, particularly at HBCU, for 10 years. I want to applaud you. I also want to applaud you uh, for your recent successes in fundraising. You've got you've had some amazing successes there. Again, uh, keep doing bravo. But where I want to go for a second, you you because I want people to understand the connection between Morgan State and Tedco. And, and you talked about research. Uh, and for for our listeners to know, Morgan State, we have a program here in Maryland at Tedco called the Maryland Innovation Initiative. We have five research institutions here in the state of Maryland. Johns Hopkins, University of Maryland College Park, Maryland, uh, Baltimore, and in Maryland, uh, ba uh, Baltimore County. And the fifth one is Morgan State University. So say it another way, Morgan State is at the same table with the Johns Hopkins and the College Parks of the world. So I want you, I want you guys to hear this and understand the story of this and why this is so important and why MII and the, the connection between TEDCO and MII and, and, and Morgan State. Well, uh, we really value this relationship uh, between TEDCO and Morgan State, uh, and we certainly value the opportunity to participate uh, in the uh, Maryland uh, Innovation uh, Initiative. Uh, as a matter of fact, when it came into existence, uh, I went down to Annapolis uh, with uh, Ron Daniels, President of Hopkins, and Wallace Lowe at uh, College Park at the time, uh, and we put forth a very, very persuasive testimony and support of this program. Um, we um, were very excited that um, there's still uh, money left in that initiative. And now that um, we are being as prolific as we are in fundraising, we are looking forward as well to um, uh, winning uh, some of uh, the competitions <laughs> and uh, uh, having some endowed professorships out here at Morgan as well. Uh, but you know what this is also enabling us to do uh, is to really strengthen our technology trend mm -hmm. operation here at the institution as well. Uh, we just released a report. Um, oh, Troy, I think of about a month ago. Um, and what this report revealed, and, and, and we were not navel gazing a, a firm out of Philadelphia uh, that actually does this for all of the Big Ten institutions. Um, they basically conducted the study for us. But for every $10 million of research invested in Morgan on about eight or nine of the leading metrics in the country in terms of outcome, Morgan is outperforming every research institution in Maryland with regard to patents, uh, with regard to disclosures um, and spinoffs, right? Um, and so for every $10 million invested, we have a higher output 
than any research institution in our state and many across the nation, including some Ivy League institutions. So the takeaway <laughs> is that if you really are looking uh, to invest heavily uh, in research opportunities at Morgan, uh, where the output is what TEDCO is about as well, which is you know, how do we create a kind of ecosystem mm -hmm. where we can uh, have startups um, and you kind of nurture those startups and eventually they kind of grow into major uh, tech uh, companies. Uh, well, um, for every $10 million invested in Morgan, you know, you're going to get uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, startups and a lot of spinoffs. Man, that's, that's, and you know, it's these types of statistics that um, not just for Morgan, but a lot of HPUs, people just don't know. Uh, I think they, they, they see the smallness of them and they don't see the productivity of, of the HBCUs. We get, we get too caught up in bigness and not caught up in real productivity measures like the ones that you just, that you just mentioned. So I, I'm glad you bring that up and for our listeners to know that. And you know what most people don't know very quickly is that in terms of size, we have about 8,000 students, right? Uh, the largest HBCU is North Carolina a t at about mm -hmm. a or so, uh, but we are right there in the top what, oh, five um, in terms of size. But uh, most people don't know that when you look at the Ivy League, uh, Morgan is larger than a, a few Ivy League institutions. So uh, those Ivy League institutions, other than Columbia, are not that large. And Columbia is the size that it is because it has a land grant mission. But when you look at the size of Dartmouth, uh, look at the size of Princeton, Princeton. Mm -hmm. and Brown. Um, so it's not about you know, having 55,000 students. It's about what you are doing in the innovation space. What are you doing in the student success space with the students that you have, and then what are the opportunities for further investment in these institutions? And Morgan is open for investments. Well, look, I, I can't, as, as an as a engineer by training, electrical engineer <laughs> to be exact by training, I can't tell you, you know, someone who's been involved in the uh, diversity efforts in STEM for 30 plus years, um, I, I applaud your efforts and I thank you for your efforts because uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I know it's a challenge to get more of us into these spaces. So to have that level of productivity out of, out of your institution, again, I personally thank you. And I mean that sincerely, man, because I, I know how tough it is to get more, particularly black males, just be blunt, more black males into this discipline is very difficult. Well, you know, being the president here at Morgan uh, is a joy. Uh, I often say to people that other than, you know, the times when perhaps uh, we have an unfortunate tragedy in our family here at Morgan, um, I rarely, rarely have a bad day. <laughs> really have a bad day. Um, there's purpose um, in the body of work that we have undertaken. Uh, and so every single day uh, that I come to this campus, uh, it is really very clear to me that I'm coming with a purpose. Awesome. Uh, and no day is lost because at the end of the day, everything you do here at Morgan has made opportunity available for someone. That's beautiful, man. And again, but that's back to person. I, mean, I think that, that that's born from how you grew up, it, what, the way you describe that, I can hear, I mean, I can hear that, how you grew up and your story of how you grew up, you're emulating that and trying to showcase that and you feel this need to pay it forward. That $5 your dad gave you, you're trying to reinvest that into somebody else. Well, that's, that, that's true. And, 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 and actually another thing that I've kind of kept with me and trust me, as I said, I've gone around the world, I've had some quality time with you name a, a world leader, uh, living or deceased, uh, I perhaps have had an opportunity to meet mm -hmm. her. Um, but it's humility. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I don't really wear arrogance well, not at all. And I don't really enjoy being in the company of people uh, who, um, uh, who, who, who present that um, as who they are. Uh, and so what I try and present uh, here at Morgan to our students is that you can climb the highest ladder to the highest place, mm -hmm. but never, ever, ever forget the first wrong. Oh, it's preach, preach. That's, that's a preach right there. <laughs> that, that's preaching right there, bro. That's preaching. Well, look, man, um, so we're sitting here, we're in March of 2021. And as, as David Wilson looks back to January of 2020, I'm sure you, you and your board and your team there, and you know, I know some of your key leaders there, y'all had your plan for 2020 and you had it all laid out. And then something happened around mid-March of last year, this thing called COVID that we're still sitting here dealing with. 
So I guess I want to get your listeners to hear or listeners to hear just how David personally has kind of been, you know, navigating this, this thing called COVID. What have you been personally, how do you keep yourself moving? Maybe it's playing some basketball. But then <laughs> how, how have you had as, as a leader and, and Morgan itself, obviously you had to make some changes in terms of student uh, being there on the, in the, in the campus, but how have you had to move Morgan? And, and my last part of that, um, how do we, how do you come out of this? What, what do you see you learn from this that's going to propel Morgan to even greater heights? So, you know, uh, personally, um, I have experienced loss as well. So I, I've lost uh, three family members over the last uh, year or so, um, including my oldest brother and, mm, I'm sorry. and, and a sister-in-law. Um, and so as president of Morgan, I have to understand that quite a few Morganites, uh, students and faculty and staff, uh, have suffered some of the same kinds of losses. Um, and so what I try and do uh, is to uh, show the university community uh, that we are all, if you will, um, you know, we, we're all making our way through this together. Yeah. And so uh, personally, I, I, of course, take long walks. Um, I come on the campus every single day uh, in the morning, uh, early in the morning. I get up here sometimes about 6.30 or so. Um, they have a little space over <laughs> in one of the uh, intramural gyms uh, where I can go and do my treadmill, um, so I use that as an opportunity to uh, mentally just kind of stay alert. Um, uh, but it's important for me to stay connected to the campus, even though we are remote. Uh, and so that has really, really helped me uh, to maintain the purpose and to keep my eyes on the prize. Mm. Now, um, as we have come through this, um, we have a very, very strong leadership team here. Morgan is one of the best leadership teams that I have had in my 30 years of higher ed across four institutions. Um, and so um, that team um, has um, worked with me hand in glove um, to make the tough decisions, uh, to pivot on a dime, um, and to coalesce uh, around the great mission of Morgan and never ever lose our way. Uh, and so as we look to the fall, uh, we are planning a full reopening. Of course, everything is only based on where the science is at that time. Yeah. Based on everything that we're hearing, uh, there will be enough vaccine available by May 1st for every person who wants to be vaccinated to be vaccinated. And so we are operating on the assumption that we'll have herd immunity by then. Mm -hmm. I just this morning, Troy, I charged uh, what I called a re-socialization and re-acculturation group of about 50 people. And we are planning. Um, in late August, what we are calling a Morgan family reunion. All right. All right. And, and it's going to be a week of activities where we are bringing people. You send me those dates. I'll be there. You I send, send you those dates. Send me those probably, dates. I'll, be, I'll be hearing our band all over Baltimore <laughs> City and hearing the voices of our great choir as well. That's going to be good. And that's, that's going to be great. And, it, it, you know, us coming together, I think, you know, we've, We've learned a lot. I say we've learned a lot out of this. Um, you know, one of the examples I, I, I talk about, David, is when we came out of 9-11, right, we had to change our behaviors about how we came in and out of buildings, how we traveled. Uh, we, we, we added new lexicon like TSA and, you know, and different things. And, but we all we traveled a lot, obviously, and we had to travel the three ounce bottle. That's the only way you could travel was it? And, and so we're going to have different behaviors coming out of this. And, and so one of the things that's Tetco and, is, and, and I've challenged actually some of your, uh, your, your faculty and I've challenged faculty across the, uh, the state. What's the three ounce bottle example that's going to reinforce some new behaviors that are going to come out of this that we need to be investing in? And frankly, let's be blunt, Maryland should lead in thinking about that. And Morgan State can help us lead in that whatever that three ounce bottle example is going to be coming out of COVID. Well, uh, certainly, I think one uh, is going to be um, a, a greater embrace of what we call hybrid learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we have invested here at Morgan so far about $5 million um, in retrofitting um, up to 280 classrooms uh, with, you know, motion cameras and um, audio. So, so in essence, um, we would be moving more toward a student choice model in terms of how a student at any day where he or she is having a class can personally decide, uh, do I want to stay in my residential hall? Oh, wow. Basically, 
you know, do this live streaming uh, or do I want to physically trek across campus and do that, right? So they may decide on Monday to go to that class personally. On, on Wednesday, they may decide to stay in their residential facility. And I think that's going to stay with us uh, after COVID. It's, a, it's an investment in technology that will return significant dividend mm -hmm. and part of that three ounce follow. Mm -hmm. I think the other, and I have been pushing for this nationally, um, is um, we are gonna have to hit the reset button on what we call standardized assessment tools. Um, I think <laughs> I think the, the life of SAT and ACT. Uh, I think I think we all on, on life support. Um, I agree more. And uh, what COVID has done, because many of those students could not get uh, to testing centers, and so you have all these institutions uh, that have had to admit students now two times in a row without having those test scores. And we have to devise what I call the qualitative assessment tools. The teacher evaluations, you know, the, you know, show us examples of leadership, show us examples of grit. Um, and so I don't see that coming back. I, I see a lot of institutions right now going test optional. And, and by the way, I can make a little news here because it's going to come out, I think, in about you know, a week or so. Um, so um, I, I'm a member of the Board of Governors of the NCAA. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the highest governing body within the NCAA. So, <laughs> we were the ones that made the decision to cancel Mar March Madness last year, and we made a decision to tonight have all of our games in, in Annapolis for the yep. just March Madness. Um, but um, I have been asked by the NCAA to chair um, a 20 member task force on, on even whether the NCAA should continue to use these standardized tests uh, as a criteria uh, for player eligibility. There you go. So this is an area as well where I think um, it's going to make its way into the three ounce bottle. Yeah, and, and I'll add, it's not just the admission side of it, but it's also the merit scholarship side, because I mean, I think the, 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 the little, because my daughter's going through the process now, and they say test optional on admissions, but they still are using the testing in some cases for scholarship considerations. And so, you know, you, you got you got that little, you know, you got to read the, the, the fine tooth. Uh, the fine writing there. Well, look, man, I, I, I know you're busy, but I can't tell you how much I I've, I've appreciate you. I appreciate your story. I really hope somebody, I know somebody heard you. Um, not to just heard you, but takes it to heart and they got their $5 from their daddy, right? And, and, and they're gonna find their way uh, to, to, to Morgan State uh, or any of our great HBCUs. And so I really appreciate, you know how much I appreciate what you're doing there in Morgan. Um, looking forward to getting to spend some time when we get out of this madness. Um, and like I say, let me know when the fan reunion hits. I, I will be there with the, ba with the Bears. I'll be there. We look forward to having you on the campus. And so cool. the doors to Mark Morgan are always open for you. I appreciate that. Well, look, thank you, listeners. Thank you, President Wilson, for, for your leadership and for what you do for, for Morgan State and for, for the state of Maryland. Uh, thank you, listeners. I hope, again, today you really heard something that really made you think about where you are in your station in life and that just because someone in your family hasn't been, there's always got to be the first one. There always has to be the first one. And that it doesn't mean that you can't be the first one. So hope someone took away from that. So again, this is Troy Lamel Stovall, CEO and Executive Director of TEDCO. We'll see everybody next week on TEDCO Talks. Thanks again, David. <laughs>